there since March of last year, so it's been a bit of a stretch. Nice to see friends again. Nice to see some guests who joined us. We have a wonderful presentation today. I think this is a, a, a historic occasion for our history society. And then we have the uh, debut of uh, Cesar Becerra's book. And uh, on the occasion of the 125th anniversary of Miami. And uh, uh, there are books here. Uh, Cesar will be signing the books in the back. As a matter of fact, I think it's going to be a rare opportunity for three of the principal people involved in the book to sign your book if you buy a book today. So take that into account. So without much further ado, I'd like to bring up Cesar Becerra and start his presentation featuring his new book, Orange Blossom 2.0, and maybe a little bit of information about Mary Brickle that we didn't know. Just a little bit. Caesar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Good to be here today. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, this book has been a labor of love and kind of like a journey to birth. This book has not been easy. Uh, linearly, it's about 25 years of work. 25 years ago, I curated an exhibit at the Women's Club of Coconut Grove on Mary's things and debuted a new photo of Mary, which would have been the second photo that was seen of Mary. The other two we debuted today turned out not to be married. So when we're wrong, we have to say we're wrong and we can move on. But there was once a time when there was no photo of Mary and a lot of unfortunate myths about why there was no photo. She was too ugly. <laughs> she was cantankerous. She was too mysterious. Not wanting to be for all that stuff. We know that's, that's wrong. We're just looking at the wrong places. But it did hinder Mary Brickle from getting her due share of recognition. And even if you move the photo out of the way, today I'm gonna to present some interesting facts that we've just, some of them have just learned in the last 25 years, and some were there all along, but we didn't see them till recently. And by recently, I can say five or 10 years ago. But what you see here before you is the cover of Orange Blossom 2.0. Now the name of the book, Orange Blossom 2.0, is derived from the myth story of, of Miami's birth has always been intertwined with the following. A plucky widow, that's a direct quote, from Ohio, from Cleveland, named Julia Tuttle. After the freezes of 1894 and 1895 that devastated the state of Florida, some temperatures went as down to like 14 degrees. Crazy stuff for us to imagine. But it happens every 60, 70 years, this thing happens. And she miraculously sent Henry Flagler, a bouquet of orange blossoms. And he magically moved and extended his railroad 77 miles down the way. Now, I'm going to pause. That's the presentation. Thank, That's you, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. That's very, very oversimplified. Um, I'm going to pause and tell you a little bit about Henry Flagler. He's Rockefeller's partner. On two occasions, Rockefeller said it was Henry Flagler. That was the brains behind the operation of Standard Oil. Now, by brains of the operation, you also have to think these are the most shrewd and not so above board negotiators on the face of the earth. And they got in huge trouble, not just from the federal government, but even the federal government's top people like Teddy Roosevelt, et cetera, went to war with people like the Rockefellers and Flagler, et cetera. And so you have to understand that no amount of beautiful orange blossom is going to take this shrewd negotiator to move heaven and earth through lands he doesn't own, some of it he will be able to own, some of it he has to buy, some he has to cajole, and just magically show up in Miami. The story is much more nuanced than that. Now, the cover of the book we designed with Cindy Syke, who's here today, she'll be signing books today along with B. Brickle, Mary Brickle's Great granddaughter is here today. B, thank you for coming here today. Why did I not see Cindy? Cindy's here. <laughs> the design of the book, it mimics a legal document because we believe that this has been a case that's been kind of covered over and sometimes not so kind of covered over, sometimes blatantly marginalized and actually not covered at all. 
So I start off with Julia Tuttle is the only mother of mine, which is most of the time when you bash your head against what I call the worldwide internet wall, you're going to come across the story of Julia Tuttle over and over and over and over again, even in popular places, uh, in Nassipak, but you will not find too much on Mary. A little later, I say, well, not exactly. And I say here, kindly, actually. I, I think if I were to redo this book, I would redo the word of reimagining. That's just me being kind of humble here. Uh, because I really do believe she is a co-mother of my head. But for now, I'm saying, listen, let's take these things we've learned about Mary and, and use them. Now, the cover comes from a design that I was inspired when I saw it in The New Yorker. It was uh, five artists that were commissioned to somehow pep up the Mueller report, make it a little sexier to digest, and grab, and read, etc. And this one artist from Japan kind of took the title of the Mueller report and kind of hit it and brought it out, highlighted it. I really like that. I didn't know that we were going to be onto something. I just thought it was a cool thing. But lo and behold, two weeks ago, folks, two weeks ago, this is not an old issue. This is two weeks ago. A friend of mine named Heather Niger was at the airport. And something caught her attention peripherally, and she looked at the magazine rack and she thought, God, it looks a lot like Caesar's book that's been bashing you over the head with this design that was a little weird. And some people didn't like the design, actually, I'll be very honest. And uh, there it was, the same kind of concept. Not only that, when I looked closer to it, the politics of teaching America's past, the history war. That's the story of Mary Brickle, because there's politics. There's jealousy, there's money, there's propaganda. There's a lot involved in this story. So I'm, I'm pretty happy we're kind of like in that zone of, uh, of uh, we were on it. I think we were on it. So thank you, Cindy, for taking my concept and, and, and turning that out. Now, you will not find, and I hate to, you know, first anybody's bubble that was here to find a lot of uh, photographic evidence, but in our book, you will not find, well, any photos. You will find one drawing of Mary, which was beautifully done from a photo of Mary by the artist Christina Peterson. And we felt it was important because one of the things that prejudiced Mary from getting recognition was that there was no photo. And so I did not want to lean on the age old, well, where here, here's one, and that's, that's my case, case closed. Now we have one, everything. Well, I really wanted to lean on the facts and the nuance and the questions that have never been asked a lot about the deal that started by it. And here's Mary Burke. Definitely not ugly. Does she look like a cantankerous person to you? There was a lot of myths that did go out into the world about the Brickles. Uh, this is the first photograph of Mary ever found in 1992 uh, a short four foot eleven Cuban immigrant named Carmen Petsulas found the first photo of Mary. And she did so because she just by chance happened to live across the street from Roosevelt Peacock, one of the founding families of Coconut Grove. And she said, well, Roosevelt, tell me about this neighborhood. I really like it. I'm glad my husband chose this house, blah, 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 blah. She goes, well, it was started by Mary Brickle. And she just asked a simple question. Well, was there a photograph of her? And she said, well, no, actually, no, nobody, nobody's, nobody's found her. We don't think there is her. And she then went on for 25 years until she found the first photo of Mary. This photo here, looking great, by the way. Actually, this little guy right here, Casey Pickett's in the house. He, 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 you know, tweet this photo up so we can really get a good look at it. Um, I think I have a more close up here. But um, it only said on the back, mother and myself. It's the only clue, but it was inside a box that was given by a librarian in Opelika, that was given by a relative in Ocala, that was given down from a relative named Demaris Purdy, who was Maud Brickle's companion and, and friend in life. And that, when she unlocked the myth of how, and, and Demaris Purdy and the Brickles, obviously they, you know, they, they knew each other. Once we found out the connection, we've now found two more photos of Mary. So there are now three photos of Mary and four of William Brickle, which is where we're going to pause now and give you kind of a historical look of, well, how did these people get to Miami? This is a photo of Miami. 
1883, somewhere in the late 1880s, early 1890s. Hard to imagine, that's downtown Miami, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> there is a building in Miami, off of Brickwell. How many stories, Casey? The tallest building? Oh, uh, 84. 84 stories tall. The tallest building south, on the East Coast, south of New York City, is in Miami. But in this photo, I assure you, there's no tall buildings. <laughs> and it looks like, and for many years, many people said, well, this is a great photo to start with the birth of Miami. This, this kind of conjures up the birth of something, right? It looks like an early photo. And I used to think the same thing, but to the Brickles, this was the master's degree. This is going to be their final, final moment and challenge in life. They saw this as a beginning of something, their, their biggest challenge. Now, before they got to Miami, they actually met in Australia. This is their house on the Miami River, by the way. This is the Miami River, again, downtown Miami. And there was not much there. A gentleman named uh, Thorpe, a guy who traveled with William Brickle, said, in these days, there were like nine families. It took you two days to count them if they didn't move. You know, when you're in school, is it an county that don't move? So it's a lot of work. I mean, and, and, and they were spread out. There's not, not a lot of activity. There's a CVS on the corner, a uh, Home Depot to repair your broken window, etc. It's hard life. Here's Miami again at the beginning of, uh, of, of clearing out the real farm. But William Brickle met Mary Brickle in Albury, a little town called Albury, Australia. So William Brickle was from Ohio, from Steubenville, Ohio. Went to the California Gold Rush in 1849. In 1852, he goes to Australia for that gold rush, makes a ton of money, and it's there where he meets Mary. He's from England, and remember that. She is from England. She is not an American. This comes in later with 20 of the reasons that I believe she's been marginalized in early Miami. And forget England, and she's Australian. Kind of even weirder than being an English person in that time area. It's kind of newer, different, you know? And she grows up in Australia from age three to like her, her early 20s, basically. Um, but they meet in this little place called Albury. And they meet in a city that just was become the name of Albury. It used to be called the Crossing Place. It was nothing. It was like another Miami. And there was a river there, a big river, not like the Miami River. Like the Mur it's called the Murray River. But it could have well been the Mississippi River. It was a huge river. And people would try to cross that river because there was no bridge. And they would get in trouble. Some would die. Well, William Brickle put in the first bid, the successful bid, to build the first river across the Murray. And I want you to know that our William Brickle here was not just making money in gold and twiddling his thumb. He was building cities, or a city in Australia. He was already calculating logistics of how important bridges are. And we're going to come back to how important bridges are in Miami's first story. But he was a founding father of Albury. And he met uh, uh, married there. They married five years after they really met, five or six years. They did have a daughter out of wedlock. At the time of the birth certificate, uh, Mary did not put who the father was, just to not besmirch any family's names. She went away to have the child. But on the baptism certificate, I'm very proud uh, to say that there are a few things that I found. I've actually leaned on people like Casey and Paul Jordan and other people who found uh, Larry Wiggins. This book is not just about me, but I found this, but this one I can claim. I found the name William Brickle on the baptism certificate. So she could lie to the state, but not to the religious sense. <laughs> we found Alice Brickle. So we now know that they did. I say this because there's so many myths about the Brickles. Every time you find one that you can verify, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good day. For the Once they finally left Australia on an 85 day trip, 85 day trip. Imagine you're newly married, you have a child. On 85 days, anything can happen, and it did. They had their second child during that trip. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we get on a plane, we watch a movie, go to the bathroom, and you're in California. It's done. 85 days. They had to go from Australia to California, California to the Isthmus of Panama, no Panama Canal at the time, Rickety Railroad, another boat to New York, 85 days. 
suicide, folks. There was a statistic in those days that every 11 hours, a boat would just go poof and missing. It might come back. Sometimes that boat would be missing, then it would be hobbled into a port, but sometimes nothing. So it's suicide just to go anywhere back then, but they did, they moved their entire family. First New York and the D.C., then to Cleveland, Ohio, where they lived with three blocks away from Henry Flagler, Rockefeller, and a lady named Julia Tuttle. The Cleveland connection, big time. So in Cleveland, William Bertolt Mayer, what are we going to do with this money? A lot of money. By the way, a lot of money was made in Australia. William Brickell owned a hotel, a commissary type store, uh, a lucrative contract for the ferry across the river, the bridge contract, and also a hotel. I think I said hotel. And uh, with that, he kind of chilled out for five years. We have him in Cleveland on the census for five years just doing nothing. Mary is there as a seamstress, but Will Williams doing nothing, but probably thinking, where are we going to park all this money? But the Brickles had already been adventurous once or twice in their life. They were in for one more. They didn't want a turnkey operation. They wanted a challenge, and they picked South Florida. And this was a big challenge, not easy. Finally, they bought four parcels of land from a lady named Harriet English in, in South Carolina, who it was. South Carolina. And Harry English sold William Brickle 2,507.83 acres of land. And what we didn't know, but just 10 years ago, he put it in Mary's name. Now let that settle in. A woman who could not vote, in some cases could not buy land, in some other states, you had to be with your husband every time to do anything. She was in ownership of 2,507.83 acres of land. That's great. But by 1896, before Flagler gets here, she's in ownership of 6,400 acres of land, making her one of the top landowners in Florida and maybe one of the ones in the United States. Not a small thing. And if you're getting the picture here, Mary is a big player in what's about to come. They get down to South Florida and they build a small kind of well, it looked big in the early picture, but a trading post where they would live, trade with the Indians. Bill Brickle probably put together the first reliable trade network of going to and from Key West. He wanted to get to Key West, he got on Bill Brickle's boat. Uh, and I say that because you couldn't get to Miami very easily. You had to bypass it on a steamer, go to Key West, take a little boat back. Everything was hard because there was no deep water port here. The Native Americans is important because I, I write. Uh, about them. And a lot of times when you hear the Indian trading post, that's all you hear. And there would be this, that, and the other. But, you know, the Seminoles, this was the first time after some grueling wars, they were very, very horrid towards them. And in some cases, they fought back very hard towards us, quote unquote. But this is the first time that an olive branch was shared. This is the first time they could come and stay a while. They stayed three, four, five days sometimes at the Brickle uh, place to, to trade everything from hides of deer, gators, etc. And they trusted the Brickles quite a bit. Um, in fact, we have letters upon letters of moments where something would happen. And the Seminoles, even as far up as Fort Lauderdale, would say, wait, I don't want to go further until Bill Brickle is right here or Mary Brickle is right here to settle this issue. One occasion, we know that Bill wrote to the United States government about a food poisoning of the deer, uh, you know, uh, catch or what have you. And he said, this, this cannot go on. So the bird was also defended. And this, this is very important because, as, as Paul Crockett, another historian, says, you know, the Seminoles were not always treated, even after the war, uh, respectfully. <laughs> you know, in places like Usa Isle, et cetera, when they were there kind of silent and static exhibits, there were comments, really derogatory comments, just because they weren't talking doesn't mean they could be treated terribly, but they were. So the Brickles treated them very fairly. In fact, uh, as, as B. Brickle writes in her uh, uh, forward of the book, they called Mary a little angel. You know, they really trusted her, they had a lot of affection. Here's William Brickle right here, uh, overlooking, uh, I guess, a capture of one of the largest alligators. Open a grove of barnacles, uh, oak houses in the background. We have four photos of William Brickle. Here's them a little bit earlier, more in life. 
some of their land holdings in Australia, the hotel that William Brickell built in Australia, the bridge they built across the Murray River. The moment they showed me the bridge, and this guy, Joe Woody, had the audacity to say, I'm freaking out about this photo, hearing about this story over for many weeks and finally seeing the photo. He said, why are you getting so excited? I have a bigger one at home. And sure that he has six foot enlargement to go the bridge. In Australia, by the way, in this very room, I have never had this moment in my life. I had eight historians arguing about the Brickles in this library because they knew but there had to be a photo that one of them remembered about the Brickle Hotel. And the other said, no, it's a drawing. No, it wasn't, it was a photo. It was fun to see finally someone taking the Brickles seriously because for many years they, they were just kind of pushed aside. I visited uh, their grave, the family grave, the place they got married. William and Mary Brickle married in this church, Mance. This is a kind of a, before they built the church to the right, uh, this is the, the location of where they married. In Melbourne, by the way, March 20th, 1862. And now we get to the story that is really the heart of Orange Blossom 2.0. If you look closely on this side of the slide here, the PowerPoint, there's nothing really happening south of like the Cape Canaveral area or that area, Tinesville area. I mean, nothing. Since 1893, this map was done. In three years' time from this map, Miami would already be born, but notice how desolate everything was. Now, the politics behind how Florida got open was interesting, shady, and very insider. Okay, in those days, you were uh, there was an entity called the, in, the Internal Improvement Fund, and it was the mechanism that allowed the state to kind of produce their land, give away their lands in invest, have people invest in their lands to let it go into the private hands. And they were really good at it. They would give as much as 3,500 acres of land for every mile of railroad land. That's a lot for every mile. And Flagler got so much by the time he gets to West Palm Beach, he is already, we have documentation that on paper, he's already kind of given so much land that in a sense, he's already kissing North Miami Beach, just so you know. And this is important because the whole adage of luring him down is a false angle because he's already promised and in possession of some of those lands. Now he had to go through private landowners and he had to go through some seriously private big landowners like Albert P. Sawyer, who should be called the granddaddy or the godfather of Miami because without Albert Sawyer's land, there would be no Miami. So even if you take Julia and Mary out of the picture, you're ignoring Albert P. Sawyer, who's an industrialist from Boston who owned thousands of acres of what I call the in-between lands, okay? But you also have Mary Brick, not just only 2,000 acres on paper in Miami, but 2,000 acres in Fort Lauderdale and 125 sneaky acres in West Palm Beach that we didn't know about for about 10 years ago from Beth Brickell wrote her book, pinning Flagler from doing anything before talking to the Brickles. In fact, we now have letters of Flagler using the deal with the Brickles to tell Tuttle, why don't you give me another 100 acres because the Brickles just gave me another 100. So we have politics being played. We also have a contract that was signed before Julia with the Brickles because the Brickles were very, very astute at clearing up the titles to their lands where Julia had a lot of problems with other people saying, wait, wait, this is my land. You had to always clear that up before. You didn't want to sell something and have someone sue you later. So the Brickles had four months before uh, Julia signs anything, William has to sign, who can't get down, but uh, Fiverr has to sign with, with Mary. And sure enough, we have signatures, documents with Mary Brickles signing first. And that's not just some fluke, it's because it's really in her name, okay? Look how desolate Miami is here. Coconut Grove had been already going for a while. Uh, this is raw, raw, raw country, okay? You had to really have a vision. And, and we do always hear about Julia's vision. And yes, she wrote a lot of letters. And yes, she did a lot of pronouncements in the newspapers and the people. But, you know, vision vocally is one thing. But no one buys 6,000 acres at a time like this that doesn't have some sort of plan for it, okay? That's just ludicrous. This is, that's an immense amount of land. Uh, and also we have Bill Brickle on record 
with Ralph Monroe in his book, uh, The Commodore Story, almost kind of ad nauseum talking about the future and how great it's going to be and the development of Miami. This is a photograph of the freeze at that time. I'll pause here just for a fun story about photos. And I, I believe that there will be more photos of Mary Brickle coming out. Because for years they thought there was never going to be another find of a photo of Billy the Kid. This is a photo of Billy the Kid. It was a National Geographic not too long ago. And for many years, they're like, no, that's not Billy the Kid. And then they argued for many more years. And then they found out, extrapolating everybody else in the photo. Let's see if I have a big photo of them. Well, there's more people around in this particular photo. And once they figured out who everybody else was, they said, ah, this has to be Billy the Kid. And this one Billy the Kid photo where the original one went for like $300,000, this was going for $2.3 million. Now, I'm not saying Mary Brickle's photo, next photo, photo number four will be $2.3 million, but it's got to be somewhere. You know, we will probably hear more. We don't have to have one, but I bet you there's more. Eventually, it all comes out. Now, on Julia Tuttle's part, you know, I, I, I'm kind of really disappointed because, you know, we take for granted certain issues. Okay, she's been called the mother for so long that it's very easy to go from the mother so long to this first line of Wikipedia. It was an American businesswoman who owned the property upon which Miami Court was built. That is not accurate. If you look at the original contract of the city where everybody signs on the dotted line, you have a contract with the north back of the river, with about a mile up, mile over, and on the south bank of the river, Brooklyn, look how much Brooklyn land is. You're ignoring the fact when you say on Wikipedia that the land we find was built upon, that's wrong. Because this is the entire city's boundaries. And it's in this document where you have signatures of everybody, starting with Mary Brooklyn, then William Tell, then William Brooklyn, then William Brooklyn, then William Tell, and James Ingram signing for Flagler. So it's important that. We respect these times. You know, all the other documents that they fight over either has just Julia Tuck or just the Brickle. But the first document that has everybody, those are the main players. It even says so on the left side. This is the city of Miami. This is the boundaries. This is where it starts, where it ends, etc. So that's important to know. But for years, we've given the birth certificate over to Julia. And I just think, I mean, there's no committee that speaks every now and then to say this is the birth certificate. Um, here's Roosevelt. We've got, here's Carmen Pinsulas. Now, I say Carmen found the first photo, but that's just one thing. One of the largest collections of Brickle memorabilia at Fuller International University at the Stephen Green uh, and Northern Green Library is Carmen's voluminous work of all the notes and all the documents and personal effects of, of, uh, of uh, William uh, Brickle Jr. and, uh, and and his wife, widow, Claude, before she passed away, Bush Brickle and others. So lots of stuff, stuff that I haven't even seen, by the way. This book is not so comprehensive that it's everything. It's just about the first story. Beth Burkell, he was a Brickle, but a Burkell. Some Brickles went to France, so they be yeah, the pronunciation. <laughs> and she's not a Brickle from this family, but her father got so into it that she got uh, uh, Beth into it, wrote a fascinating book on Miami's history. This is Miami on its 15th anniversary, and we are now celebrating its 125th anniversary. But we also need to know that for the Brickles, it's their 150th anniversary. They got here 25 years before the city's born. And let me tell you, 25 years back then is a long time. There's no internet, there's no Netflix, there's no running to the store or calling Grubhub for some pizza with the extra entry, all that stuff. 25 years, folks. That's a long time. And I'll end off with this story, then we'll take some questions. Um, this is a document that has uh, surfaced. Um, it is from 1910. It's not published in 1910, but it doesn't say 19 published, but there's a letter in there, you know, part of the founding of the book that says 1910. Uh, from this uh, book of growth entity. And in it, just to show you how interesting the story of the orange blossoms can be parsed and pulled away, immediately after 395, Henry Flanders see a spray of lime blossoms. Now 
now it's line block. What do we do with that? Well, in 1920, November 20, 1920, James Ingram did a speech at the Miami Women's Club. And he went on about how he cut several different clippings <laughs> of different trees, put them in a box of wet, damp cloth, and brought them up to Flagler. Notice the difference. He brought them up to Flagler. The story is that Julius sent them up. But do you think that Flagler would actually believe anybody but his people on a deal that would have a lot of money behind it, a lot of problems politically? He had to go to the legislature to clear up all the land. He had to get Albert Port Sawyer out of the way. He had to do private land deals. It was a lot. Um, and he actually said at that moment when he saw these clippings still green, he said, gentlemen, are you sure? And James Ingram says, yes, we collected these. So again, it's, 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 that's the story. It's so simple. If anything, this book is a testament to let's take the simplification of everything. And, you know, everything is a little more complicated than what it seems, especially if it sounds like a great sound bite. And Mary Burkle herself wrote, um, actually, this is a voice that, uh, that we credit a lot with showing us the way that, that Mary really was a mother. This is Jane Wood Reno, uh, Janet Reno's mother, who's an astute writer, journalist. Um, and she just didn't say this because she wanted to say it. In those days, in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, even in the 70s and 80s, you relied on what we call the clippings file on any newspaper. Every newspaper had a little old lady or a little old man cutting away the whole newspaper and then stuffing it into little envelopes. As efficiently as they stuffed the little envelopes, the writers would take them out and never put them back in the right envelope. <laughs> it was a mess. But she was looking at those clippings and from the clippings, and I agree with her, because now I've seen all the original articles. In the early days of Miami, it was always Mary was mentioned with Julia. Julia was mentioned with Mary. There's some articles that in the title, not in the actual buried in the article, but in the title, it says both names at the head of the city roster. Both names are mothers. So I don't have the exact title, but, but, but they're there. In my book, of course. But we credit her not only like so much, I travel with it everywhere I go. <laughs> uh, B. Brickle is here today. I, I got to spend uh, an enormous amount of time in the house. I thought I was going to be there for three days. I ended up 31 days there. The story's in the book. <laughs> See, the book. <laughs> but uh, that's not our house, no. This is her visiting, not Laura. But it was at uh, B's house that I got so into the the donation that she made to FIU, the partial donation, that I, I got to the level where I, it was almost like the Brickles internally were, were calling me from the grave. It says, you need to tell the story now. Of course, the pandemic was hitting and there was really not much to do and it looked like the right time. And then somebody told me, they had to tell me, my mind was in right. But the city's gonna celebrate its 125th, so I felt this was the time to do so. Mayor Kaba, I wanna thank her in a 24 hour period. Mia was my amazing assistant on this journey. We, we clocked that in one 24 hour period, she said Mary and Julie were the two brothers of Miami on three occasions. And on one occasion, she corrected somebody while they handed her the mic after telling all about the Julia story. So the word is getting out, not just because she may like the book or she's friends with the Roberts family, but she had her people work with my people on the evidence before she included it in January State of the County speech. No one had ever mentioned Mary at that level ever. So very happy and proud. And uh, here I am with the great project of the 125th. It's a whole other story, but uh, I love getting uh, authentic memorabilia. So we're gonna pause here. And I thank you all for coming out. And if you do have any questions, I'll be happy to. And, and let you know that we will be here to sign book, not just myself, B. Brickle, Cindy Sight, and five dollars of every book sale will go to your amazing group. So, Wonderful. thank you for having me here. Good questions. Yes, John. Wait, who did the Brickles get their land from? Uh, Harriet English. Yes, she was a landowner. They got it from Fitzpatrick, I believe, originally. Oh, right. English. Sorry, what was her William name? But her son and Fitzpatrick. Fitzpatrick was the uncle. Yes. So long ago, during the Civil War, there was plantation size and plantation plantations down here in South Florida, 
with slaves, you know, working the land, etc. Um, through the years, that was brought down to Harry. So she inherited this. Well, land. Actually, actually, William English was the one who brought slaves down to South Carolina, and he had the the, the plantation, slave plantations in Lone Park. That was his logic for slaves, but they weren't down for very long because the Second Seminole War got out of the way. Yeah, got out of the way. So he took his slaves back to South Carolina. So it wasn't a slave plantation for very long. But he did actually map out part of the south side of Brickell area. And he actually named roads uh, Corpus and Nolfton. So he wanted to sell land. He platted out that, that area, which is now part of Brickell City Center. And he didn't get any takers. Nobody wanted to buy it. So it was platted out at one point in time, long before the Brickell came back. And, and there are four parcels that William got, but he didn't get them easily. In fact, when he got the land, he got power of attorney to have the land to the moment that he cleared up all the title. It took him three years before, in 1874, when he truly legally takes full possession of the land, but unbeknownst for us for many years, he put it in Mary's name. And I believe, we believe that he already saw that Mary was astute. Uh, he also noticed, and maybe had self noticed, that there were a couple of times that Bill Gribble lost his, his cool. With Flagler, uh, with Mary, with Julian Tuttle's father, he had a fallout with Julius Tuttle. Very important to know that the marginalized family had a fallout with the mother, so called mother of Miami, his father. So, you know, I mean, all these stories and more are definitely in the book. Just to add to it, not only did the Britons acquire the land from English, but also from the part of the Jonathan Lewis and Howard Lewis donations as well. So, their land went all the way beyond the sky. That land was not insane second. amount of land. Insane. Yes. Let's go back to an elemental question. Sure. Oranges have always been a central Florida crop. Yes. Limes have been grown in South Florida. Where were the oranges being grown in the Miami area? Are there orange groves? Well, two places that we know for sure. That's a great question. Um, we do know that Kirk Monroe did grow oranges and actually had a whole uh, tradition of giving people oranges from his. And actually, we don't know if even the oranges were picked, even in Miami. It right. could have been picked in Kirk Monroe because he visited Kirk Monroe. Also, Julia's father did have an orange grove in his property that Julia inherited. So we do so know that for sure. That's Lemon now, City. Though. Yeah, Lemon City. Uh, we don't think it like, was like a Massive operation, just orange. It might have been a little bit of everything. I think part of the Merrick plan was also small orange growth, but mostly grapefruit, right? But yeah, but I think maybe it, maybe it rolls off the tongue. Orange blossom, very nice, yeah, doesn't it? It does, and it is a fragrance. You think lime blossom, you know, lime it's blossom, kind of like, yeah, yeah, it's not as uh, sweet. So it does make sense that, that you know, anecdotally, there were stories of they took cuttings from the limes. Well, here's where it gets good on the orange blossom, literally. During his speech in November 20th, 1920 at the Miami Women's Club, he talks first about the box, the wet den cloth, the different tree clippings, but later in his speech, maybe just at that moment, could have been just at that moment, he mentions that when he got to Flagler, he showed up the orange blossoms. There he actually says orange blossoms. It's part of it. It's part of, but in that point, he, he designates blossoms. And that also be something that shows Bivalent, you know, like yes, the, the, the trees are vivacious. Right, right. Here's a blossom. Yes, I have a well, question. We're on Zoom, by the way. Right. I don't know how many people. I have a question. Well, you have 28 people on the Zoom. Okay. So, um, I have a question from Sarah. I know Julia Tuttle died in 1898. Do you know when Mary Burkle died? Yes, she, she died in 1922. Okay. January and 13th, 1922. And how long did the uh, Tuttle family stay in Miami? They stayed a little longer, although some of them went to Nassau, I believe it was. Well, yeah, the, the, the she had a son and a daughter, Fanny, actually, after she got married, she went off to Nassau. Harry stayed here. As a matter of fact, Harry, when, when Julia died, bought out his sister and all the, the Tuttle property he inherited, and he developed an area called Fort Dallas Park which was a, a vibrant first residential and then mid-rise apartment and hotel area. 
So, okay, and the last part of the okay. question is, yeah, yeah. Um, I know the Brickwell stayed a long time. Um, do you know how long they were here? Um, they were Miami royalty. The Brickwells were Miami royalty? So that's what she oh, yeah. said. Uh, well, they were here, I mean, they were here even into the 80s and 90s. I mean, there were still, and there's still Brickwells not here, but there's still Brickwells in America. But uh, the Brickwells definitely were here into the 60s and even beyond. Uh, they went on and built uh, two apartment complexes, uh, the Brickle uh, apartment complex, the, the, the Bulger apartments. Uh, you had Brickles that I've known before I met B. So they were they were they were here, I believe, probably to the '90s, really, when Butch and uh, uh, and Marge died. But uh, B's in South Carolina. Your brothers in uh, Punta Gorda and uh, in other places. So and there's a few scan others. <laughs> Yeah, they own the Miami ship building or half of it. Did, yeah. of it and they actually leveraged that for a lot of the use of the film, including it was the headquarter uh, external side of the Miami ship building entrance that was the Miami Vice Police headquarters. Yeah. That's right. So if you watch the intro to Miami Vice, you were looking at property that was owned by the first or second avenue of Miami. Thank you. Oh, yes. Question in the back. Yes, John. <laughs> Good point. Good point. I mean, you can go on and on. There's a, a, a crazy, interesting, uh, I call them uh, off ramps to this story. Uh, I try to stay as close to the origin issues. But sometimes I'd have to go out to, to prove a point. Repeat the gist of what you said. I, I didn't get the full gist, so I got half of it. It's hard to. John, could you come up here a second, just a real quick? Because I don't think everybody heard, and I can only hear about half. But I think he's trying to make a. He decided not to grow a or grow an orange grove because of those two. Oh, not to grow an orange grove. Merit there. Ah, okay. And that's the center of it. It's right, it's right here, here for the museum. Is. Okay. And that's why kind of an early name for it was Guavonia. Guavonia yeah. School yeah. was the first school there. Mm -hmm. So and there were crops. Crops that did better than other crops, basically. The center probably did better than other crops. Generally, oranges want a sandy soil, is what I'm saying. And South Florida has some sandy areas. But some, yes. A yeah. lot of it was a little small. Especially yeah. six months of the year. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. The pineapple plantation was. Used to have to get your uh, furniture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, six months of the year. So, Sandra, yeah. you uh, you talked about all the things that that Bill and Mary Brickle and Holland and Cassidy were doing. You didn't mention who they sold all that to. Yeah. Find out. Uh, we need in Australia. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, any of their uh, land holdings or anything affixed to Australia. I'm assuming well, actually, they, they, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, well, they left it to their business partner, Adam yeah, Castor yeah. Kid, some of it. And some, they, he actually thought he was going to go back a couple of years later to watch it. He still had some business interest still making him money, et cetera, when he left Australia. Now, he did close up some of the businesses and then haul off. And interestingly enough, we believe there could be a case for one of the objects, one of the amazing artifacts that B has donated to FIE is a weight scale that we for sure know was at the Brickle Trading Post. But Alan Crockwell, who's an expert in some things that are pretty old, but way older than me, say that it, it could very well have gone back to Australia in terms of, he looked at the original scale, it does come back in use from the mid 1850s to the 1890s, so it is possible. And then you have the the weights that go to the scales, those are just weights with the final weight. The scales are weighted to the actual amount of gold dollar value from gold, not just uh, weighing, you know, half a pound of ham or something like that. So that's an interesting, you know, and that could be a lot of different, you know, so we haven't totally nailed where exactly what, you know, where they, when the genesis is that, is that scale used in the post office? In the house? Possibly, probably almost, 
guarantee any stuff in the river trading post. For sure in that area. Yes, sorry. The white building that we see on the right side of the river, is that the, the tallest white building that closest to the bus? That's, that that's on river land. I don't think that's their, their trading post. The trading post was in the uh, earlier shots. There was a canoe club, a boating club. There was a boating club. That, that was actually a building that was leased by Salem Brown, and it was the first land-based hotel after, uh, during the year of 1896. Right. So he, he operated a hotel there that he took over, hotel land, and was being built by the, the Cubs. Right. So uh, that was actually a, a place that they were expecting because people it was taking, to stay. It was taking time to build a big hotel. Yeah, and he just went ahead and converted that to rooms. Yeah, yeah, the tunnels actually, they were building a hotel called Hotel Miami. They were hoping that would be the first hotel that would open, even prior to the Royal Palm Hotel. But then they realized there was more to it than just putting up a hotel. There were people checking in and climbing ladders with their wives <laughs> and propping doors up for privacy yeah. before <laughs> this thing was ready for privacy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rough, well put. Any other questions? Thank yeah, you. I have a oh, couple oh, more oh, here. Oh, 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 okay, oh. from Becky Natloff. She okay. oh, she okay. asked, uh, where was the trading post located, and uh, were there other trading post locations later? And uh, the photo of the trading post you mentioned is that still active. Was that still active in eighteen ninety seven? Okay, a lot of questions here. First that of all, there were other question. trading posts. <laughs> Berkowitz were not the only ones. Uh, there was one on the North Bank River operated by Patsy West's family. Uh, there was one obviously in New River by the Stranahans. There was one on the other side, Small Woods. And they were trading boats. It wasn't, Berkowitz had the only one, but they definitely had the biggest central one. Uh, they even had at one time the only place in Miami that had a safe. So on in, in banking history, you have to give the Berkowitz on teaching history, aside from Coconut Grove, when Mary Brickle brought in a tutor for her kids, that would have been, and she invited other kids to be, she would have been the first principal in a way. And her daughter, Alice, the first teacher in this, you know, kind of the city of Miami, Lemon City. She would go on a boat every day to Lemon City. So you have a lot of firsts. But the, the Brickle Trading Post sat as close to the water on the river because they would canoe right up, well, canoe or boat up to the actual building. Now, when, how far it went, I do not know. When, and I do know that as soon as Miami started earthing, then everything shifts to the north bank of the river. With the exception of some early grumblings of the fact that the post office is still in the Brickle Trading Post. And on day one of Miami, adding to the fuel of the fire and why the Brickles were marginalized, after the corporation and was any new business, somebody raised their hand and said, we gotta get that post office out of the Brickle Trading Post. And over to the North Bank, because people were waiting for the ferry. Are they taking the ferry? They get there's no mail. So it was a problem. And IE problem starts to be Brickle's negative, no good. Joe Kinech wrote a great article called Not Everybody Liked the Brickles. He has like 21 reasons why the Brickles had a, you know, had a kind of a negative outlook because, but you know, in the end, all of the things that people were grumbling about, no one would ever contradict later when they cashed it in for a smart move. I mean, you know, they were looking out for, and they were also wanting to plot a part of the city that was unlike the North Bank. Mary Brickle famously said a, year, a month before her death, I, for years I've been pressed upon Mr. Flagler about widening the narrow streets of Miami so they may be a pleasant pleasure instead of a, you know, a, this crazy delay. And that's part of the birth of the city. It was, it was kind of madhouse, you know, the mad dash to, 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 to profit. The story that I had heard as a kid was that she had a reputation she would loan you money. Yes. You know, quiet. Yes. But to a lot of Without people. Without contract. Not, not to other well to do people, but right. that she would sit and listen and help people out who needed help. Particularly to the African American community, yeah. which is part of uh, not just myself, but Dr. Enid Pickney. Had said publicly Wednesday that this is something that definitely uh, prejudiced people against uh, giving the Brickles any credit. She was too nice. The population were in the Deep South. That was that like a big culture. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. All sorts of. Yeah. You had a question. Yes. Uh, I remember how 
Hold on, hold on, one second, one second. You can't hear it. Yes. The Miami River had a small waterfall somewhere at the Philadelphia Army Corps yes. Engineer. Blew it up, yes. There were there are photographic evidence of rapids on the Miami River, even though we feel like we're in Florida and the flattens of banking. So much water going out of the, the Everglades and a healthy Everglades that they were churning rapids on the river. And there's actually a Miami River Rapids Park today that they covered up the smooth portions of those churning areas. So there is a, an actual park called Miami River Rapids Park. So yes, there were little rapids, not huge rapids, but it was considered a great thing, a great improvement to fill the rapids. Yeah. But but again, a family story was that for two weeks, every all the water table drained down to that level. Big time. Not three feet. Yeah. And a lot of water went away. Once that's you remove okay. those dams, that's uh, yes. Okay, so I have a couple more questions. Okay. Uh, from Becky, please elaborate on the disagreement between Ephraim Sturvant and ah, William Brickle, perfect. and how long did their hostility last? Okay, so we just learned not too long ago in uh, a book that I actually purchased here at the museum, uh, the book on the Coco Plum uh, Cemetery, the Pioneer Cemetery, and in that book, there was an article that they talked about uh, Thomas Thorpe, who was with William Brickle when he left New York. So now we have a definitive January 11th or January 12th, 1871. We didn't have a lot of definitive dates when the Brickle arrived. He talks about the 13-day trip from New York, getting in a storm, etc. Thomas Thorpe tells us that on that boat, part of the disagreement was that William Brickle had enough lumber for Sturdivant's house, Julia Tottle's father's house, and his house. But William Brickle's house started to be built first, and by the time they went to go ahead and build Julia Tottle's father's house, well, there wasn't enough wood. Well, you can imagine, in my opinion, I don't think it was Bill Brickle sticking it to Ephraim Sturdivant. There's a lot of lumber lying around. A few pieces are going to be pil pilgrims, you know, but, you know take it. And so that was the impasse. And in fact, he threatened to take Bill Brickle to court, started the process, but never did. But that was the fallout between William Brickle and uh, Sir. That's a great question. You can see both sides of that. You promised me enough wood for my house. Right now. Right. And now there's not enough. I think part so, of it also is, uh, from what I've read, is that part of the wood was not usable. Uh -huh. And part of it got wet yeah. and became unusable. And so they, they didn't have enough. There were calculation problems, but there were also quality problems. I think there were a little bit. I've read, all, I've read that too. I mean, uh, but there was a fallout. There was almost a court case, but there was not. It didn't go to its final run, but they definitely. And it's an important one because, you know, you're talking about, you're, you're looking at the difference between two families and there's a fallout. It also speaks to the value of a scarce resource. That's true too. But we do have all the details now of that first trip down with the lumber, etc., yeah. which is interesting. And again, in a book that had seemingly looking like nothing to do with, but I bought that book here at this, uh, this museum. So, and I, I was just looking at such a cool, cool book and boom, I looked in the index and it says, you know, Brickle, and I went to that page. That's where I got that story. You know, it was a fascinating. Another question, when did Flagler build the bridge across the Miami River, which he promised the Brickles he would do? I'm going to turn that over to Casey because never did. Not that particular yeah, bridge. The bridge was built by the Pagan Brothers that went uh, through the road stream. Uh, the bridge that, that we know today is the Brickle Bridge actually was built in 1920. So, and to give you a sense, Flagler died in 1920. So he he never, they never built that bridge. And until he was incentivized to extend the railway to Key West and go further south, uh, they didn't build the bridge. The, the original bridge for the right of way is today for Metro River, uh, or Metro Rail. That was the original right of way. That didn't extend over until uh, maybe the uh, roads. Did the railroad have a stop south of the river, or was the next stop open and road? Well, the, the next stop uh, was further south. I'm not sure exactly where the next one was, um, but they, they, they kind of veered away from Coconut Road yeah. because there were landowners who were beginning to move the price of, of land that they were 
need to go that the way. The question was whether the line of the west. Did the railroad stop on the north side of the river and again on the south side, or did they just kind of? I, I don't think that there was a no, south. It was the south side. That, that's kind of a dish right there too, isn't it? Yeah. Well, to backtrack just a little bit, um, the contract with Rickles and Flagler stipulated that, that, that Flagler build the bridge over the river before the railroad got to Miami. They feared, and in fact, Graham in his letter, uh, which is watching the land and the issues of building things, said so. The Rickles are sore. We're not keeping up with our promise. We're way behind. And that's what happened. As soon as the railroad got here, everything boomed in the north. So even peripherally, people in Miami don't even think the south is anything, because right. everything is booming in the and north. They, they should have known what was up because of the way they built out the Royal Palm Hotel. The casino would have gone right parallel with what we know as Brick Avenue today. Right. 1928, when they took out and they extended the bridge, or the Brick Avenue bridge, they had to do that after they took out the swimming pool or the swimming casino. Right. So if you look at the original map and see exactly where the hotel was going to go, the Brickles should have had a clue that there was not going to be a bridge built along there. The only other thought might have been having the E to do it over that bridge. But there was no indication of that map until earlier of any kind of bridge. And they agreed to dividing up the property. And I'm surprised that Mary, Mary and Bill did not insist the bridge be accountable to some of that. Well, you would think he was a bridge builder. You would think his, his land is a hundred times more valuable with a bridge. He maybe should have thought about that himself. In 1896, Bill Burke was like the 70s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he was. Well, even when they even when they first came to town. I mean, of course, who would know? Maybe he was betting that the railroad would land on the south side. He was side. betting on the fact that let's let this guy fund the bridge and I'll, I'll put it in the contract. Yeah. Uh, but what we read, that's 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 what uh, that's what was in that initial. Yeah. Um, but clearly, road access gave land tremendous value. And without road access, land was of very little value. Once you put the road in, that was all the difference in the world. And good for the county, too, because then they taxes went up on land. With, with an interesting twist to the exception of the rule, in the end, the land actually ended up being more valuable, ironic, be, ironically, because when the city boomed, the quieter place, the place of more time to think about and marry to design was on the South Bank. Yeah. And of course, the, the land prices were really skyrocketing. Uh, per acre. Yeah. It was more acre, acre than yeah. downtown. Definitely. I want to mention that the book, uh, I think, is one of the first to come out, not just in English and Spanish, but also soon in Creole. We do have a Spanish edition today, um, and soon there will be a, a Creole edition. We'll be in the back room. Thank you guys very much. Uh, we're just getting back on our feet. We're just walking before we can march here. And, uh, and hopefully, I mean, you almost have to check the news every week to find out what the new deal is, right? Awesome. And, and virus is better, it's worse. <laughs> just to keep our fingers crossed, it gets better for a little bit. Next month, we'll be meeting up for a field trip in Paris. So uh, you can check the website for me. If your question wasn't answered, I will relay it to Caesar and get a, him to answer you personally at a later date. Thank you for coming, everybody. <laughs>